Amen. Welcome, everyone. Before I get into the Word, I'd just like you to go to the Word, into the Lord in prayer with me, please. If you'll bow with me. Father God, thank you for the day, this day that you, we shared earlier, Lord, that it's a day we can rejoice in. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for your holy word. Lord, thank you for your word in music, your spoken word. Thank you for the privilege of prayer. And Lord, I just ask as we come together tonight and we share your word that your Holy Spirit will have total dominance. And Lord, I ask that you will allow us to share the word in power and in strength as you would have it. Lord, your word says we are to worship you in spirit and in truth. So, Lord, let us prepare ourselves for the movement of your Holy Spirit in this place tonight. And, Lord, I ask that you would fill me with what your Holy Spirit would, would have said. And, Lord, these, your people would be blessed, would be challenged, and would be uplifted by your Holy Word. Thank you, Lord, for everyone who is here. Thank you, Lord, for those that couldn't be here tonight for whatever reason. We ask a blessing on both the ones that attend and the ones that aren't. We ask a blessing on those who might be watching over the internet, Lord. We just ask that you would just make this a special night when we could just worship and love and adore you and place you above everything else. We love you, Jesus. And it's in your holy and precious name I pray. Amen. Well, if you were here last week, I uh, made the statement <laughs> that we would never be a great commission church until we were a great commandment church. I've tweaked that a little bit this week because who's the church? Us. So I tweaked that a little bit and said we'll never be a great commandment people a great commission people until we become a great commandment people. And as we get into this tonight, I hope you will see, because we're going to be in Matthew 28, and in verses 19 and 20, which is commonly called the Great Commission. Most of you probably al already know it. But I want to expound upon it some tonight, and I want to challenge you in some issues there. So last week, we, let me give you a brief synopsis in case you weren't here. We talked about the great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. Every part of your being is to love the Lord your God. I don't find that so hard to do. I want to adore him. I want to lift him up. And then he added right after that, that's the first commandment, the greatest commandment. And the second commandment, we're supposed to love our neighbor in like fashion. That's a little more difficult. Amen? Uh, I hope I'm not the only one that struggles with that. And so, we have to be a people who are concerned. We have to be a people who are wanting to reach out and to touch others. And that's why that God, I think, brought us to the Great Commission. I was watching a program this week talking about just what Moses was sharing the last time he had a message here about the immensity of the universe and how many billions of galaxies there are out there. And the program was actually a scientific program trying to discover whether there was life on other planets or not. I don't know. God knows. And he's, all, he's in charge of all of it. He has the ability to do that. I don't have the ability to keep my life under control a lot of the times, and he's got the ability to juggle billions of galaxies and planets and way beyond my comprehension. And as I thought about that, I thought about abilities. I think there are two kinds of abilities in the world. There are God-given abilities that come to us 
out of no other reason other God's grace gave them to us. And take that person who can sing, who just has that voice. It's clear, it's beautiful, the tone is perfect, and they hit every note just like they're supposed to hit. That's not me. I'm far from that person, okay? But that's a God-given ability that he gives as he wants. And then I think acquired abilities. As I, hello. As I thought about that, I thought about that person who is a bodybuilder. Okay, I think we're having a little technical difficulties here. Get through it. I thought about that person who can bench press 500 pounds. That's an ability that that person acqui acquired over years of training, years of practice, years of increasing. They worked on. So, those two abilities. I think our ability, ability brief pause. Okay. I'm on. Hello. I'm on. Okay. So I look at <coughs> two abilities that we can give back to God. Did you ever think you have an ability you can give to God? Hmm? Well, I think we have two abilities we can give back to God. You want to know what they are? Thank you. I'm glad you asked. The first one, and of course, this is a play on words, is availability. God will use our availability. All we have to do is show up. All we have to do is say, God, I don't know how to do this, but I'm going to show up, and whatever you do with me showing up is fine with me. So the second ability besides availability is dependability. Showing up when we say we're going to show up. My Marty has a favorite scripture. She's got a lot of favorite scriptures, but she's got a favorite scripture that she goes into often. And let me ask you this, because you've heard this from this pulpit more than once. If God's word says something more than once, what's that mean? It's pretty important. What if he says it three or more times? Very important. Uh, thank you. You all have been paying attention. That's cool. The Bible says that our yes is to be yes and our no is to be no. And that means not only are we supposed to respond however the Holy Spirit's leading us to respond when somebody asks us to do something, but we respond wholeheartedly. What do I mean by that? Well, you don't say, yeah, I'll do that, and walk away and go, why in the world did I ever volunteer to do that? No, no, no. When you say yes, be that person of dependability, and let your yes be yes, and your no be no. Mean what you say and say what you mean in that situation. And like I ask you, what does it mean when the, the Scripture says it more than once? Check it out. Matthew 5, 37, 2 Corinthians 1, 17, James 5, 12, all use that very self-same phrase. Did you get them, you note takers? Did I go too fast? Uh, <laughs> one more time. Matthew 5, 37, 2 Corinthians 1, 17, and James 5, 12. So, as we strive to be great commandment and great commission people, my challenge there is be available and be dependable so God can use us. God wants to use you. God wants to bring you into part of the great, glorious kingdom that he is building in this place and worldwide. Guys, One of the greatest things we can do to serve our Lord is be that dependable person. That's a real good place for an amen, y'all. <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's not touching you the way it touched me when I thought about that, but it's kind of interesting. So let's get into the Great Commission. And we all know <coughs> verses 19 and 20, or probably know about them, but I want to back up to verse 16. This is Matthew 28, verse 16. 
Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. Uh, if you can go back through the, the scripture, in Matthew 7, it, Jesus tells them to go to a place. So the eleven disciples are gathered on this mountain. Jesus has told them to be there. He'd meet with them there. Remember, this is after the resurrection, okay? Look at verse 17. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. Yeah. But some doubted. Wow. We're talking about 11 apostles who'd been with Jesus. They'd seen the water made in the wine. They'd seen the dead risen from the grave. They had seen miracle after miracle. They had seen people healed. They had seen him go to the cross. And now they see him resurrected. And he's called them together after this. And he says, come together, worship. And some doubt it. You ever had doubts? Look what they do. They worship through their doubts. Best thing you can do when you have doubts is get in a worship situation and setting somewhere and let God take you where you need to go. God says, worship through your doubts. Did you know it's okay to doubt? Do you know it's all right? Some people tell you, oh, if you have a doubt, you're, my goodness, what are, you, what are we going to do with you because you have doubts? Hey, you know what? We're human. We're human. Things don't always work like we want them to, and because they don't always work like we want them to, we think, oh, my goodness, what am I doing wrong? You may not be doing anything wrong. You may just be getting drawn closer to Jesus Christ. That one hit me about when they worship through their doubts. Jesus came to them, verse 18. You all know me. I use King James Version. You just have to put up with that. I'm sorry. And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and on earth. Wow. All power. You look that word up and get into it, it says all authority. He is, has the authority and the power to do everything. Anything and everything. If you really de uh, delve into that word, it says that he has the privilege, the ability, the competency to do or not to do with the meaning of the strength to enforce it or to accomplishment. So God can do what he wants. Do you know that? He's God. God can do what he, whatever. He has the power the authority, and the ability. Now, we say we can do whatever we want, right? How many times in your life have you really had the power, the competency, the authority, and the power to do exactly what you want to do? Not much, right? I mean, you know, I spent 50 years in the workforce. How many of you get up every day when it's time to go to work and say, hallelujah, I get to go to work. Fantastic. I know Marty did, so but she's exceptional. Most of us would get up some days and go, oh, man, I got to go to work again. But you know what? We do it because that's how we keep all the bills paid, right? Only God, only God has all the power and the authority and the strength to do whatever he wants to do. I wonder how that would work if we really bought into that. Because if he has the authority and the power and the strength to make whatever he wants have happen, and we would go, all right, Lord, here am I. Here am I. Do with me as you please. And too many times we say, ah, I just can't be available for that. And too many times we say, ah, that's not something I really want to do. Hmm. So all this I've done so far is being led up to working in what is commonly called the Great Commission. And do you know this? That's a man-made statement. God nowhere called it the Great Commission. But if you go back into Matthew 22, he did call the commandment the Great Commandment. 
we got to get the great commandment first, and we got to get it right before we're going to get the great commission to where we need to be with it. You're real quiet. I don't know if you're thinking or if you're going, I don't know about all that. Four points in the Great Commission. Reach, teach, win, develop. Reach, teach, win, and develop. And we're going to deal with each one of those in kind of depth, I believe. Verse 19. And I love the way the King James puts this. Because most of these, most translations omit one word that I think is so important. King James says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Most translations that I've studied omit that word ye or you. And I don't really know why. Because that, that to me is where it really comes home. It's pretty easy for me to say, go, Moses, and do. But God's saying, go, you, and do. And if you were here last week, I told you, I was, I was very transparent with you and told you that when we got to the point about love your neighbor, I researched that word up one side and down the other in every translation, in every language that I could think of because I thought there must be a loophole. As many people as I've known and some that, being very honest, didn't even like and don't like me. And I thought, man, there's got to be a loophole there somewhere. And I told you just like, I'll tell you this week like I told you that week. In plain old southern vernacular, there ain't one. When he said love your neighbor, he meant all human beings, the lovely and the unlovely. We're to care for every human being on the face of the earth. You know, think about that a minute. It's kind of easy to care for that person that's on the other side of the world that I don't know. I can pray for him. Lord, bless my brother in Christ who's suffering in China or Turkey or wherever. I can do that. It's a little bit harder when it's your neighbor across the street. You see them every day. They see you every day. I have to love them equally. But I will say this, those that are in proximity, we have to be a little more concerned with. We have to be a little more concerned with those that we see all the time. So God says, go. That was another word I played with. Tried to decide something, read something into it that wasn't there. What's the word go mean? I tell you to go, what do you, what, what's that mean? Go, depart. Move, do something. You know, the old saying, lead, follow, or get out of the way. Whatever you do, do something. And that's what it means in, in the Greek. Go means move, do something. And so we are to go. Where are we to go? Where the people need Jesus. That's where we need to go. We need to go wherever people need Jesus. Hang on. And we need to meet them as they are. Mm. What, do you think, what do you think about that? See, it's really neat to come into this setting and meet people here because you came here for a reason. You came here, hopefully, because you really adore and love Jesus Christ. And that's why you're here, and you want to worship him, and you want to lift him up, and you want to feel fantastic and you want the Holy Spirit to move and you're just praying God I want a fantastic experience by being with God's people in God's house amen, amen. that's fine and dandy it's a little different when you're told to go and to go to whoever maybe you are that person that God's going to call to go to halfway around the world. Maybe God's going to call you to go to China and start a mission. Could happen. Could happen. But it's a lot more likely that God's going to tell you to go to your neighbor down the road 
or to go to the supermarket looking for that person who needs to know Jesus or to go to the gas station looking for that person who needs to know Jesus or to go wherever looking for that person that needs to know Jesus and needs to know him needs to come to him just as they are you know what one of the worst things I think that a Christian witness can do ask somebody be somewhere and ask somebody do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and the person goes no and the next word out of that other person's mouth is well then you know you're dying and going to hell that is absolutely the worst witness that any human being could ever issue first of all it's not my place to decide who's going to heaven who's going to hell that's God's problem not mine all I'm called to do is go and do what he tells me to do that's it all I have to do is go and share with him with somebody the good news of Jesus Christ so the first thing is reach reach people where they are as they are then he says teach all nations interesting when I looked that up the word teach and the word teaching in, in 19 and 20 hold two kind of different meanings the word teach in verse 19 is to be informative to go to them and share with them information that you have I've heard sharing the gospel is like one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread so when we get to that point we get to a point with somebody and we begin to show share them we begin to inform them about what it means to, to understand Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world listen if I go along on this there's going to be some talk about other types of teaching but when you're trying to tell somebody and trying to lead somebody to Christ listen they don't know everything this says they don't even need to know everything this says what they need to know is what will bring them into the proximity of Christ period what will put them in touch with Jesus Christ that's all that's all I remember when I first got saved and if you know my testimony I wandered in the wilderness for a long time I I would have said I was saved as a teenager yeah right I got saved in my early 30s and just to illustrate to you how we change and mature I went to a Sunday school class I hate those things you know that that is the to me that is the Sunday school really Bible study I can agree with that discipling class I can understand that but Sunday school first of all what kid who's been to school all week wants to get up and go to school on Sunday morning never anyone has ever wanted to do that so I went to the Sunday school class and the instructor said turn to first John chapter 3 well, I did not know much about the Bible I just hadn't really read it in my life and just barely got saved and I'm thinking well I, I know this Matthew Mark Luke and John so I turned to John third chapter he starts reading and I'm reading and it's not jiving and I'm thinking what in the world am I missing here and one old saint that had been saved for a long time gracefully turned to me and he says no 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 first John back in the back of the New Testament and I'm going there's more than one John huh couldn't believe it 80% of the people in the United States cannot recite to you one verse of the Bible by memory what an indictment do you know that 80% of the people in the United States can't recite to you one verse of the Bible from memory so we begin to teach in the very in the very early part of somebody being saved we begin to be informative they need to know the Bible says certain things 
But they don't need the depth of theology. They just need to know that there's good news in there. And I'm not saying to be evasive, because you, you can't be. Churches have done that for too long. Do you know that? We have been evasive for too long. When the hard question comes, we don't want to deal with it. When we're sharing Christ with somebody who's just lost a loved one, and they go, well, why did this happen? And we don't really want to get in depth there. But there is a time to just bring a certain amount forward. So we're to teach them. We're to inform them of the good news. We're to inform them of grace and forgiveness and salvation. You can't tell anybody better news in your life or theirs. And I get people all the time tell me, well, I don't think I know enough about the Bible to share that with them what they need to know. Well, two things. Number one, study it until you do. Amen? Number two, you don't really have to know about the Bible to bring, if you're saved. Let me put that, let me throw that in there. If you've been born again, you don't really have to know it. All you have to know is, I was here, I met Jesus Christ, now I'm here. I'm not perfect, but I'm growing. They can tell you, I don't really believe in the Bible. Well, they may not, but guess what? Your story is your story. And the truth of your story is the truth of your story, and no one can deny that. So all you have to be able to do is to, when you go to, show, to witness to somebody. I was here. I met Jesus. I am here. I'm a changed human being. Reach, teach. The next word I use is when. And Jesus says this baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Okay, before you guys get to thinking, well, he's, he's saying that I must be baptized to be saved. No, that's not what I'm saying. But when we, quote, unquote, win somebody to the Lord, and I don't even know exactly how to work that in there, but what, who wins? If somebody's one to the Lord, who wins? Well, they do, for one, because they have just received eternal life. But the ultimate winner is Jesus Christ. The ultimate winner is somebody else has been added to his kingdom. Guess what? You and I aren't the winners or the losers. God's the winner or the loser. Somebody denies Christ that you're witnessing to, they're denying God. They aren't denying you. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. But when they're one, when they become a believer and a follower of Christ, the word says that we were baptized into one body and one spirit. Now, the, uh, the word baptized in the uh, Greek is baptizo, and it means to be fully immersed. So when you came to know Jesus Christ as Savior, or somebody else comes to know Jesus Christ as Savior, they become fully immersed in the body of Christ. Did you know you're fully immersed in the body of Christ? I hope you know that. Praise God. I'm looking for a scripture. Just give me a, a second here. Nothing seems to be cooperating. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For by one Spirit, we are all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. And then verse 14, for the body is not one member, but many. So when that person is one to Christ, they are immediately baptized into the body of Christ. Now, do they have to be baptized in the water to be saved? No. Should they? Absolutely. And you know why? Because normally water baptism is the first act of obedience that a newly born again human being does. So, 
If you've been struggling with that and you haven't been, you need to be. Is it going to change anything as far as your salvation is concerned? No. Because, see, you're saved by grace through faith. You're saved because Jesus Christ hung on a cross and paid your sin debt and my sin debt. He shed his precious blood for you and me. That's what brought salvation. Everything else is obedience, guys. Everything else is obedience. So we win them to Christ. Reach, teach, win. And the last word I used is develop. But I'd like to change that word to disciple. And I think the church in the United States has missed the mark woefully when it comes to discipling people. Really do. It's kind of hard to disciple people. And that word disciple can mean a disciplined learner, but it's so much more than that. Look at verse 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Listen, if you don't get anything else out of this, get this. A disciple is not only one that learns, but is also attached and a follower of his master's doctrine and conduct. Did you get that? A disciple is not only one that learns, but is also attached to and a follower, a follower of his master's doctrine and conduct. If we're disciples of Jesus Christ, we'll be followers and obedient to his commands. Whoa. That doesn't come from the church too often. We're all willing to go, oh, well, you know, he said this and he means that. Or, well, we're saved by grace, so, you know, we can get away with whatever. Or, well, hey, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Don't judge me. Guys, Jesus, Jesus has just said that we are to disciple. We are to teach them who's them. That's the ones, that's the ones that we, we, we share the gospel with. That's the people who come to, to Jesus Christ. That's the church. We are to teach them all to observe all things. Whatsoever I have commanded you. What was the great commandment? Love God and love your neighbor. Hmm. Now he goes on, he says, I am with you always. Jesus says, I'll be there. You may not be able to do this in your strength. You may not even understand how to do this. You may not even want to do this. But I'll be there to, to walk you through it. I'll take you where you need to go. Maybe you don't think you have any ability, but you do. You have ability and strength and power in Jesus Christ. You ought to get happy about that. All right, shouldn't do this, but I will. Are you all happy? You all happy? Do you all know what the peace sign looks like? You remember the peace sign? Huh? Show me a peace sign. Everybody show me a peace sign. All right, turn it around. Put it right here to push up. That way you'll smile and, I'll, and you'll all look better, okay? If you're happy, tell your face about it. Let, let your face know you're happy. We need to be happy about Jesus Christ, guys. We should be the happiest people on earth all the time. I love Jesus. We shared last week when we talked about loving Jesus. That's adore. We are to adore Jesus Christ. Whoa. Hey, do you adore Jesus? That means, you know, when I got married, quite a while ago now, but I could, not <laughs> I could not imagine not being close to Marty. Why did I get married? I wanted to be with her. And I would get my buddies from back when, and they'd go, hey, uh, we're all going over here. You want to go? Well, is Marty going to go? Oh, no, this is just a guy's thing. Nah, I don't want to go. 
Because if she's not welcome, I'm not welcome. I want to be with her. Well, you know what? You're the bride of Christ. I've never been a bride before. You know, I'm kind of getting there. But, <laughs> but I've never been a bride, but I'm the bride of Christ. Christ wants to be with me, and I need to want to be with him. That's what it's all about, guys. Get excited about Jesus Christ. Get so fired up about Jesus Christ that, that he just comes bubbling out of you until people can't see anything else but Jesus. Reach, teach, win, develop. Guys, if we will do that, see how much you've been paying attention over the last little bit. You notice there's a pattern to obedience. When we are obedient, things happen. Somebody I know and love has said, obedience is the funnel through which, anybody, can anybody complete that but me? And the person that said it? Come on, you guys can do better than this. Obedience is the funnel through which all blessings flow. You knew that, didn't you? Huh? You want to be blessed by God? Be obedient. Pretty simple. If you don't want to be blessed by God, be disobedient. See what happens. It's not going to work out too good for you. I promise you that. I promise you that completely. What does it say about us if we're not following the commands of Christ? I want to dwell on that just a minute. What does it say about us if we're not following the commands of Christ? Well, it says a lot to the world. It really does. It says a lot to those that are observing. And you know everybody's observing. Do you know you're being watched? If you don't know you're being watched, let me tell you, you're being watched. Your neighbors are watching you go and come. And if you leave your house and you have this tucked under your arm, and I do hope that you are bringing the Bible when you come to church, I know it's the modern age, and you do it on your phone and all that, and way above my pay grade. I don't do that. I carry the Bible. I like to turn pages. But when you walk out of your house and you have your Bible in your hand, I promise you, your neighbors are looking at you and going, well, there goes that Christian. And that's a good witness. It really is. Praise God for that Christian that walks out, and they can see where you're going, and they know what you're about. Trouble is, they're watching also when you walk out and the tire's flat on the car. And you begin to tell the car and the tire what you think of it. Maybe in not the most graceful of words, but we're all being watched. We are all being watched because why? We're the body of Christ. We are to be those that set the example in our lives. We are to be those people that other people can look to when things are falling apart around them, when it's just crashing down. And they go, don't you ever have any problems? Sure we do. Anybody in here without any problems? Anybody in here completely problem free? Imagine that. Not one of us. And it doesn't matter whether you're a teenager or you're my age. Problems stay with you all your life. Understand that. What speaks highly and profoundly of a Christian is how we handle those problems. How people can see Christ in us coming to the forefront in the middle of our problems. How people can look at us and see that we are different in many ways. Will you be patient with me while I chase a rabbit here for a minute? I said that we need to go where the people are. And I don't encourage you doing anything like this unless God leads you to do it. Because it can be challenging. But for years, Marty and I rode with 
CMA, the Christian Motorcycle Association, and we dealt with the less than lovely people in the world. But one thing I found out about that, if you'll stand firm for Jesus Christ and you will be bold enough to step out for him, amazing things can happen. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with C25, where it runs out of by the villages over there. And runs out. Well, on C25, there's a bar called County Line Bar. And ABATE, which is a motorcycle rights group, had their meetings there. And over the years, we'd been asked to serve as chaplains for ABATE. So once, at, you know what, they had their meetings on Sunday. So one Sunday, I went to the bar owner, and I said, uh, let me ask you a question. So what? And I told him what we were all about. I said, what would you think about us having a church service here Sunday mornings before they have their meeting? He said, I think that'd be fine. So for years, they closed down the bar on Sunday morning. And we had church service there. It's real interesting to have church service in a bar, guys. Let me tell you that. But you know what? People came to know the Lord. People were saved. See, God doesn't ask you to be anything special. God knows I'm nothing special. He just says, step out and do something. Something will happen to you. I'll do things. You don't have to. All you have to do is there. There is no substitute for presence. Did you know that? If you're not here, you're missed. And I know I'm preaching to the choir right now because you guys are all here. But there is no substitute for presence, guys. That's one of the things that we say so much about. You have to yes be yes and your no be no. I want my yes to be so strong that if... I'm going to meet Dino to go fishing at 4 o'clock in the morning. I want to be there at quarter of 4 sitting there with a fishing pole in hand. That's how we should be. We should be such a people of integrity that if we say we're going to do something, it's going to happen. So I'm going to ask you to do this. Will you say, will you a covenant with God right now to say, I am going to be a great commandment person? I am going to love you, Lord, with every fiber of my being and as strong as I possibly can in every situation. And, Lord, if I'm going to do that, then I want a covenant with you to be a great commission person. And you know what? If we'll do that and go out of here expecting to meet people that need to know Jesus Christ, you'll find them. You'll find them at Home Depot. You'll find them at... Wherever you shop, Publix, Winn-Dixie, all these, whatever, you'll find them at your work. You'll find them at your recreation. And guess what? You may even find a few in church. So if we will decide that we are great commandment people, we will be great commission people. And that's the challenge, guys. That's the challenge. So I don't know if I've done this message or God's word justice but I do hope that I've challenged you tonight and I do hope that from this moment forward no matter what your reputation has been your statements will be exactly yes is yes and no is no I pray that will happen because only when we get there have we moved from the world system to kingdom living? And I don't know about you, but I want to be living in the kingdom. And if you're one of those people that think, well, the kingdom's pie in the sky and I'll get there when I go, when I go to heaven, you're wrong. God's kingdom is right here, right now, in God's people. And he wants to move in God's people. And he wants to fill God's house with those that need to know him. And the only way that's going to happen, and 
I'm not taking anything from the Holy Spirit or from the power of God. But you know what he does? He uses faithful people to grow his kingdom. It's the only way our kingdom is going to grow, guys, is for us to be faithful and for us to spread the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ.